Uh, yeah, we're live. Okay, good. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome here. Uh, this is on, for our Good Friday service. Uh, we welcome the people that have joined us here in the sanctuary and those uh, that who are watching remotely, um, and, and I'd like to give a, a particular welcome to the members of Wyola Church who are joining us today. So thank you so much for joining us uh, on, uh, for Good Friday. As we gather this evening to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross, we reflect on the tendency to take the persecution and crucifixion of the Lamb for granted. Tonight, may we become mindful of our indifference, realizing that we do not praise God as often as we now realize that we should, that we do not share our love as freely with others as we should, and that we do not forgive others as often or as promptly as we should. We, try, we have tried to use God instead of allowing God to use us. This is repenting hour. We commit to redirect our will in alignment with the will of the great I am. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray for forgiveness and pardon. Amen. And now, uh, if you could join me uh, for the call to worship, and the words are in the bulletin and on the screen in front. Draw near to the cross of Christ. We draw, draw near, near in awe and attitude. Enter this ancient and sacred story. We enter open to transformation. Find your place in this holy narrative. We seek to receive anew the grace and love of Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn today is O Sacred Head, o sacred head Now Wounded. Um, and the words will be on the screen, uh, on the on the screen in front of you. Oh, 
Please join me in our unison prayer, which can be found on the screen in front of you and in your bulletins. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we, who by Jesus' act of love have been granted the free gift of salvation, that we take our cross and follow him. Help us walk in the way of Jesus. Help us find our place on this path. Invite our hearts to be moved and our faith to be stirred. Amen. Our scripture readings today will be read um, by uh, Sherry Langeal, uh, and she submitted a recording that we will be playing for you now. Good evening. I invite you to follow along with the scripture reading this evening. Our first reading will be from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. And this can be located in your Pew Bible on page 8 through 36. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there are many who are astonished at him, so marred is his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall start with many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him with no account. Surely he had borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down from God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like feet have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away, who could imagine his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struggling for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his heart. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him in pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall feed his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light, he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Our second reading is from the book of Psalm, chapter 22, and that will be located on page 615. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. 
Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others, despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. I knew I was cast from my birth, and since my mother born me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me, they divide my clothing among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. All my help come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows are the day before those who fear me. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek them shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules all the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Our third reading will be from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 16 to 25. And that can be located on page 272 in your pew Bible. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with the true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is when I survey the wondrous cross, and you may follow along on the screen in front of you. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but lost, and walk on 
tempt on all my pride. Forbid it not, Lord, that I should boast. Is in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that drawn me most, I sacrifice them. hands his meat, sorrow and love blow mingle in hell. Did there such love and sorrow meet? O thorns composed, so rich a crown. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses uh, 1, all the way through the end of chapter 19. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to, to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. I am not to drink the cup that the Father has given me. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Aeneas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of, his, this, one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard I, what I said to them. They know what I said. 
When he said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face and said, Is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Jesus answered, Your sins are forgiven. Then he said to him, Go show yourself to the priest. Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas's, Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and asked, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom does not come from this world. If my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone For you at the Passover, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. And then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again. And said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thrones, thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I have no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you? And the power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, 
Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, cru away with him, crucify him. And then Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews. But this man said, I am the King of the Jews, Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing up near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus' hand when Jesus had when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Thinking with the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his leg. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, through a secret one, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and men and cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll now have a, a special a song before I begin my reflection.
I'd like to thank uh, Kent Stewart, who sent in that uh, beautiful video uh, for us to play tonight. It was so nice to hear his voice. Uh, he's in uh, Tennessee right now, and he's, uh, so he's sent in, sending his, uh, sent the video all the way from Tennessee. So thank you, Kent. This story, it, there's so much in it, it's hard to sort of condense it down into, into one uh, story, to one, one idea. So... Um, I thought that I would share uh, how some of my, like a personal reflection I had of it. There's a couple of things. I, one of the things I was thinking about was how, um, you know, as we read this story, there's so much of it that we don't, uh, that we don't take to heart. Uh, one of it, one of the, one of the things we talk about, we'd like to, I'd like to talk about is how uh, the, uh, the people that, when they mention, when John mentions uh, the Jews in this story, he's talking about the leaders that did not accept Jesus. Uh, Jesus had followers that were there. Uh, many of them, as you know, welcomed him into the city. But, but uh, when Jesus stood in front of Pilate and in front of Caiaphas, he stood alone. And we, we read today that even, even Peter denied him three times, as, as Jesus had, had, uh, had predicted. So uh, as I was thinking about this story and, uh, and Jesus' death, I was thinking about it in my life, the meaning of this story to me. And I, was, I remembered something that happened, my, my, that something that my father had said a couple of years ago. Um, my, daughter, my father passed away a year ago last December. And I was able to return home, uh, to, fortunately, to be with my mom and my brothers as my dad was home in hospice care so that we could spend my, the final hours with my dad. And so my dad was in and out of consciousness, so he would say things uh, that we, were, we would try to figure out. Like he, at one point he called out for my grandmother, and my grandmother is my, actually he was calling for my mom's 
my mom's mom because uh, she passed away about eight years before and he was pretty close to her. He said the eulogy over, over her graveside. So we figure that, that you know, uh, maybe um, my grandmother was there to meet him as he was passing over. Uh, and, you know, many people that have had near-death experiences have shared uh, that as well as they go in and out. Their relatives um, greet them as they go. My dad, however, said something else that was uh, very interesting to me, and I, I haven't really been able to put it together until I reflect, was reflecting over uh, today's scripture reading. And he, my dad said, the prince is on the right. And I understood that he must have been talking about Jesus, because as we know from our Apostles' Creed, it mentions that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. However, I've been thinking, the more I've been thinking about it uh, during this Good Friday service, the more I think I understand uh, about what he was trying to say. First of all, if my dad was talking about Jesus, I wonder why he didn't say Jesus is on the right rather than Prince. And I, I don't know for sure, but I think that maybe he wanted to emphasize something about Jesus. Isaiah said about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, the Apostle Paul said that now in Christ Jesus, you were, who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups, Jews and non-Jews, into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is hostility between us. My father, who trained to be a Catholic priest before he left the priesthood to become a teacher and then later married my mom, may have been sharing that Jesus brings peace. This Savior, this, this uh, Savior who will bring peace, will be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he welcomes us. In the book of Acts chapter 8, Stephen, as he was stoned to death by an angry mob, uh, who dragged him from the temple uh, where he was teaching. And, sto and as they stoned him, and, and, and as Jesus, I mean, as, as Stephen was dying, he looked up into the sky and exclaimed, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. One of our readings this evening was from the epistle to Hebrews, a letter written 30 to 60 years after Jesus' crucifixion. It was written to encourage Jewish converts in the early church. And these were, this church was probably in Rome, uh, scholars believe. And the author was writing to them to try to encourage them that they were putting hope in a Savior who understood their persecution because he himself was persecuted. A few verses before our text, the author said this about Jesus in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 12. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 17, which Sherry so beautifully read a few moments ago, shared what God had, had, uh, says about us. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Christ paid the price for our sins. So maybe my dad was trying to assure us, my brothers and me, when our lives are over, that we will encounter a loving Savior who has already forgiven our sins. Jesus reaches us through our pain because Jesus knows our pain. Jesus experienced our pain. And we read that from John's account of Jesus' trial, persecution, and death on the cross, that we let ourselves, we can, we can let ourselves be overwhelmed by that love as we read this. The very concept that God loved us so much that he became one of us and suffered the ridicule and persecution experienced by the most powerless among us should put, push the pride and vanity from our hearts. 
knowing that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, allows us and assures us uh, that although we are flawed, if we hold on to the faith that unconditional love has saved the world, we are free from the shame that we have carried around all of our lives. Could Jesus have forced his power could he have made Pontius Pilate, who cynically asked, what is truth, actually see what truth really is? Could he have destroyed the armies of Rome? Yes, of course he could have done that. He could have conquered them with angel armies. That was the deal, by the way, that the devil offered Jesus when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. But Jesus refused that temptation. And Jesus instead obeyed God's plan to sacrifice his life, so that we could be transformed by that act of grace. That grace alone will change our hearts, nothing else, so that we can serve God's kingdom with joyous, free hearts, no longer bogged down by our sins and our, and our weaknesses, because we know that, th that Christ loves us. Jesus told his disciples earlier in the Gospel of John that while they, they were sharing their last meal together, he said, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. There are many noble efforts carried out by good people who care for their neighbors. However, we know that we cannot save the world alone. Only God's grace can save us. And Jesus' act of sacrifice proves God's love for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 reminds us that God proved his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Without the cross, would we have recognized God's love for us is unconditional? This understanding that God values all people and Jesus died for all of us should move us to care more for the most vulnerable and to not write anyone off as a lost cause. Jesus did not risk the, risk, resist those who beat, mocked, and crucified him. And all through the process, he never stopped loving them. Jesus looked down as he was dying, saw his mother, and made sure she was cared for by his good friend, John. And Jesus, Jesus worked to mend broken hearts, even as he was dying. We know the rest of the story. On Good Friday, we remember that Jesus gave his life for our lives. And Jesus told us in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We no longer need to carry the guilt and shame and sin of spiritual death. On Sundays, we celebrate because the tomb is empty. Jesus conquered death, both physical and spiritual death, and through our faith in him, sin and death have no power over us. When it is our turn to leave this world, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will be on the right hand of the Father, claiming us as his own, welcoming us as he welcomed Stephen and as he welcomed my dad. Amen. I'd like now to spend uh, two moments, two, two minutes in silent meditation before we continue on with the service. And if you feel like you'd like to come up and kneel uh, in, on the, in front of the cross, you're welcome to do that as well. Thank you.
now we'll continue on with our the reproaches. Um, this will be around the responsorial. Um, you'll see um, the I'll read I'll read um, the leader's part, and then the response is, "How holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us." O my people, O my church, what have I done to you, or in what have I offended you? I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert forty years and fed you with manna. I brought you I brought you through times of persecution and of renewal and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and immortal, have, have mercy on us. I made you branches of my vineyard and gave you the water of salvation, but when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar and gall and pierced with a sword the side of your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, but you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I brought you to a land of freedom and, propensity and prosperity, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. Holy God, Holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. My peace I gave you, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a servant, but you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I accepted the cup of suffering and death for your sake, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to lead you, but you close your hearts to guidance. Holy God, Holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I called you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I pray, pray that you all may be one, but you continue to quarrel and divide. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen people, Israel, but you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my, from, of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters, I was hungry, but you gave me no food. Thirsty, but you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. Naked, but you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, but you did not visit me. Holy God, holy and immortal, holy and mighty one, have mercy upon us. And now uh, we will uh, continue with our prayer of confession, uh, which will be on the screen. Gracious Creator, we come into your presence aware that our actions and our inaction, our words and our failure to speak, have hurt your heart and hurt the hearts of others. We seek your grace and forgiveness. We seek to be perfected by your sanctifying, holy-making grace. As Scripture says, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In gratitude for this cleansing grace granted to us through Christ Jesus, we pray, amen.
And now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll sing our closing hymn, and, uh, and then we will uh, depart uh, in silence. There will be uh, no benediction today, so this will be our closing hymn. Were you there? Thank you.